The costs of war are measured in lives and treasure. As of the day we produced this episode, 6,979 Americans have lost their lives in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Today's guest warns that the financial costs of these wars have profound meaning for the United States too, for our politics and for our economy. She's Dr. Rosella Capella Zelensky this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. To do that, we sit down every week with the best storytellers around, journalists, filmmakers, scholars, and more, to make sense of the big stories shaping public life in the United States today. To help us this week, we're joined by Rosella Capella Zielinski. She's an assistant professor of political science at Boston University and the author of a new book, How States Pay for Wars. Rosella, thank you so much for being with us. Hi, looking uh, forward to having this conversation. Thank you for having me. So we're going to talk about the book in a minute, but tell us a little bit about your background. How did you decide to become a political economist, a political scientist? <laughs> what drew you to these sets of issues? No, that's a great question. I uh, was in grad school. like. Many people go to to become academics. And I was sitting here thinking about, what am I going to study? Everything's been studied. And it was during the Iraq war. And I was like, how are we paying for this? And that's what started talking about war finance. And then I got interested in defense budgets and in this broad area that we call political economy of national security. So I look at how states mobilize their economies and their society more broadly for war. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a, there's a history to this in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, we have paid for America's wars through a variety of means. Yes. It's changed now. Let's start with how was it once upon a time, and but then we'll talk in a little bit about what we're doing now. Sure. Um, so let's just uh, clear the table a little bit. So how can you pay for a war? Let's just start there. So there are a variety of options. You can tax various forms of taxation, debt, various forms of debt, and I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, printing, uh, plunder. Printing? Printing. Just, printing, just printing, printing going printing to the print test, printing money. Uh, plunder, you go in, you take what you want, you repurpose it for yourself, like Season literally the on the battlefield. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you can get means from abroad, borrow abroad, grants from abroad, plunder abroad. Um, but today, really since 1950 on, um, we look mostly at taxation and debt and mm -hmm. what I, that broad category of foreign war finance. So when we think, though, about, for example, how we paid for World War I and World War II, how did the United States pay for those wars, those big wars of the 20th century? So those are our most expensive wars, so especially World War II, costing about 50% of U.S. GDP. Compared to today, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about the global war on terror associated wars post 9 11, about 4% of our GDP. Mm -hmm. So, those big wars were paid for what I call directly. So, we, the, the US government pays 30% of that war by taxation for World War I, 50% World War II. That's progressive taxes mostly, uh, tax on the wealthy, corporate individuals, on businesses called an excess profits tax. Mm -hmm. Um, as the rest by borrowing and various forms of borrowing. And most notable for what I hope to talk to you guys today, to you both, is borrowing campaigns, war bond campaigns, um, in which borrowing is targeted to low and middle income Americans specifically. Which, side note, that actually starts in the Civil War. We started our bond campaigns in the Civil War with a man named Jay Cook, hired to sell U.S. Uh, northern debt to low and middle income Americans to fund the war. So that's where it starts. But it really takes off in World War I and World War II. So today, how do we finance the wars that we have? So we, we still have one war. <laughs> yes, still have 17 one war. years and counting yes. with Afghanistan. Absolutely, yeah, 17 years and counting. Wars. And for those 17 years, we've been paying for it by borrowing. So Linda Billman's over at Harvard and with the Costs of War Project calls these the credit card wars. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're putting them on the credit card. 
And the important thing to think about here is whose credit card and who's going to be paying for that. So it's on us, Americans. About 70% of the debt of these wars is held within the United States, and the rest of it is being held abroad. And we can talk about that in a second, but I'd like to point out about the debt being held within the United States. We often think about these debts as uh, putting at the backs of our children mm -hmm. and our children's children and the way we're going and our children's children's mm -hmm. children. But it really matters of whose children are paying these, this debt back. So for that 70%, if we look back at our previous wars, World War I and World War II that was mentioned, we had these bond campaigns. So low and middle income Americans can go down to the post office as low as 10 cents at a time and start buying government debt. And they're going to save that government debt um, until when they're ready to cash it in. So you today. It's an investment. It's an investment. Yeah. So they're going to get eventually that money back, just like many people do today who can afford to do that. So who can afford to do that? Your wealthy Americans, um, those who are lucky to have retirement accounts, probably own a portfolio, hold some government debt in around 60, 65, 70, however it takes these days. You're going to cash that in and get that money back. That's great. That's an investment. That contributes to saving within the United States and can help people. So in those earlier wars, those poor and middle income Americans are going to get that money back. So the, so the difference that you're seeing, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm gleaning from this is a distinction between uh, low and middle income people paying taxes, which was paid for yep. the war, versus making an investment that you're going to, exactly. in buying a war bond, that you're not just going to get the money back, but you're also going to get a little interest. With interest, exactly, and that's the difference. So today, having debt held by your wealthy is only in the future going to transfer that taxes, that burden in our future generations of those poor and middle income classes paying that ta their taxes to finance that debt that the wealthy owns to pay it back for themselves. So what's going to happen? They're going to pay it. They're not getting anything back. They're not getting anything back with interest. But the problem is, is that's going to transfer money away from these in households, these poor and middle income Americans, up. But it doesn't have to be that way. We've done it before in the past where, as I mentioned, these poor and middle incomes are getting that money back, transferring money back down. Mm -hmm. So we are actually exacerbating inequality in the United States today so with I'm, the way these wars are being financed. I, I'm, I'm listening to you talk about, particularly about the Second World War, and I'm, I've got Bing Crosby in my ear singing sure. Bye 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 a Bond, right? <laughs> yes. This is the era of... Disney. Yeah, Disney, Disney cartoons. The you Warner can look Brothers it up cartoons. today. Yep, go up and you can see Disney cartoons. Of one of my favorites, Donald Duck, mm -hmm. saying, you know, paying taxes, buying debt, and that's part of sacrifice. That is part of owning the war effort and being proud of what your country's doing. So who owns the debt? Who who owned the debt? So the people who owned the debt in World War II were the people buying these war yes. bonds. Who owns the debt today? So who owns the debt today? It is wealthy Americans at banks, maybe some in retirement accounts, best case scenario, is that who owns it, as well as, which we can talk about in a second, um, individuals and governments abroad who own that extra 30%. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, this really was targeted at low and individual Americans, so I can pass it over to you to show. Um, I was telling my dad I was coming on this show, and this was from my family, as I said, low as 10 cents. This was from my grandparents on my father's side, and um, we have a whole $3 in there that the government owes us back with interest from World War II. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What were the political factors behind the shift from what you were just describing here to borrowing? And this is in the, the post-9-11 period. So how did, how did we get here? Um, so World War I and II, we have borrowing and taxation. I should know in Korea, we pay for this war entirely by taxation, which is something that seems unfathomable today. So where do we see this shift? And I think that shift occurs with Vietnam. Uh, Dean Rusk says, and it, he's quoted, it's in my book, but he says, we, don't, we didn't want to start um, a war psychology in the United States. He says explicitly, we didn't want to have war bonds. We want to continue this version of life as normal. And that continues. Remember, after 9-11, you're supposed to go shopping. Yeah. Life continues on. Tax cuts continues on. So we start to see the shift with Vietnam, and we're seeing it just at its zenith today with these credit card wars. Talk about the foreign people who own, who, who have helped to finance the uh, war. Right. Today, 
Sure. What so the countries are and what they seek to get from that. And potential problems. So U.S. debt, about 30 to 35 percent is held abroad, um, and it's a mix. So the main holders uh, in terms of other states, Japan, your Gulf countries, but the key question and, or key consideration for us is China. And many people have talked about this and saying, you know, China owns American debt. Aren't they a foe, a potential foe? What's the problem here? And we need to go back in U.S. history to see what are the implications of others holding our debt. So during World War II, everyone, uh, the U.S. extends loans to others. And that sounds great. We're helping our allies. But they do it at a price. So you may have seen the movie Dunkirk or you've heard about the story. Um, all of this Herculean effort in 1940 to get the British soldiers off the beaches safely back across the channel. And that is seen as um, a travesty of losing some men on the continent, but it's a heroic effort. The war continues and they win the war. But that's not the story for me personally. Because when I see that story, I think of all of the British equipment that's left behind on the continent. Now, the British had just mobilized their economy as best as they could in full tilt. It's 1940, and they're supplying themselves. They're supplying the allies. They're supplying um, Commonwealth countries, and now they have nothing. And Churchill has this great quote. He says something to the degree of, never before has a nation been left so naked before her foes. Mm -hmm. So the war needs to continue. They have to buy, and where do they buy from the United States? And the US is like, great, we're happy to sell you armaments especially airplanes, but whatever you need, we'll give it to you, we'll sell it to you, but at a price, in dollars. And the Brits are like, well, we'll buy whatever we can get, but what do you mean in dollars? Like, we don't have dollars. They're like, well, you gotta give us gold then. And the British are like, we're gonna go bankrupt. And by the end of the year, they are dollar and gold bankrupt. They're physically shipping gold across the Atlantic to the United States. And FDR says, all right, President Roosevelt, I should say, all right, we'll help you, we'll give you a loan, lend lease aid. Mm -hmm. But, and here's the key, we want preferential trading agreements. We want to break up your preferential trading and we want to make sure that the dollar replaces the pound sterling as the dominant reserve currency, so we want to continue getting your gold. Mm -hmm. So we engage in a quid pro quo. So the danger is, if we get into peer-to-peer -peer competition in the future, and we need to borrow because we're unwilling to sacrifice and create a war psychology in the United States. Are these other countries just going to lend to us? Mm -hmm. Or are they going to engage in a quid pro quo relationship? And that's something we need to think about. The, the, so that whole, in, that whole period between the First World War and the Second World War is sort of an interesting period in, 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 in war finance. Yes. Right? So the, the, the Germans are saddled with huge reparations after yes. the First World War. Uh, the French are insisting that they have to pay. They occupy the Ruhr at one point because yes. Germany's inability to pay. German uh, inflation is through the roof. Uh, and it's American financiers, American bankers, who come up with a couple of different plans to help Germany re pay their reparations. Uh, to the British and the French, the Dawes Plan and the Young Plan in the 1920s. But those are really about paying off American debts, aren't they? Yeah, and so that's what we need to think about, is the debt, this quid pro quo, doesn't just continue or happen during the war effort. It continues after the war. And so you are putting your, you're, you're vulnerable to other states for as long as they own this debt. So, so let's let's come up to the, to the, to the, the war on terror and the, the wars after 9-11 mm -hmm. again. Um, so we're talking about, I think the number is $5.6 trillion. Yeah, so recent cost, we can talk about what this cost is, but um, the recent costs of war project over at Brown University by Nita Crawford places it at $5.6 trillion, um, which I should note is less than the Pentagon. The Pentagon places the cost at uh, $1.5 trillion, give or take. Yeah, and, and how does that compare with, so the Second World War or the First World War? Is shorter wars, how, how do they compare in terms of cost? So I think about it as a percentage of GDP, as I said, like this actually isn't a very expensive war relative to these big ones. Mm -hmm. So entirely by taxation is Korea, which is 13% of US GDP. Um, I think if I recall correctly, Vietnam is about 8% of US GDP. So perspective wise, this is actually a fairly, uh, I don't wanna say cheap to be dismissive, but not as costly in terms of a dollar amount compared to other wars. But there are, are costs. You've, yes. uh, in a recent article in Foreign Affairs, you talk about the, the persistence of inequality that's yes. being reinforced uh, 
by the way we're paying for these wars. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, so that was what I was uh, mentioning before, is these, these broader implications of finance. So when we think of costs, we can think of it as very various degrees. Like, how do we want to take that conversation? Um, and I'll pull it back for one second. My favorite quote is it from 1967, Defense of the Comptroller, Robert Anthony says, during congressional testimony, we should not have a cost accounting system for war. We do not have one, and we shouldn't have one. And I was like, what? <laughs> this is crazy. We should have a cost accounting system. So the, what the Cost of War Project does is look at these broader costs, mm -hmm. these societal costs. Um, that book came out a while back, very, very popular, Linda Bilmes, Joe Stiglitz, $3 trillion war. But what I look at is these even broader costs of the societal inequality that, it, that happens from this borrowing, right, contributing to increasing inequality by this debt being held by wealthy individuals and paid for by the poor in the future. So, so basically we're transferring wealth by doing it this way, uh, where we are borrowing this money that really only the wealthy are buying the bonds yes. that is going to produce a return on that investment. Yes. But we're paying for that with our tax dollars that are being paid. The future tax dollars. So our future selves yeah. are paying for it. And it's and who's getting the money back? In theory, it could be all Americans getting that money back. Right. Um, but in practicality. But in practicality, it's only wealthy Americans getting that money so this back. So this is a transfer of, so essentially, this is a transfer of wealth yes. from the working class and the poor yes. to Upwards. the wealthy. Yes, absolutely. Now so, you, sorry, go ahead. Now, what is the role of China in the <laughs> war on terror? Yeah, so China's been um, holding U.S. debt uh, throughout the war on terror, um, and they've started to actually per, uh, decrease their volume of purchasing U.S. debt. Um, so what, they, what we do is owe them. They've been back paying and financing these wars for a while. When you say China owns, or it has bought some of this debt, yes. who in China? Is it the government? The government. The government owns. So, so these the are, Chinese I call these, yeah, the Chinese government, um, either through sovereign wealth funds, so owns this debt. The Chinese government, the state itself owns this debt. And that's leverage. So it's not the individuals within China, it's the government. So what does that give China in terms of other relations with, with the United States, in terms of business, trade, and so forth? Um, how, does, how does it affect? I don't think it, that's a great question. How does question. it affect the, the country? I think it's a great question. I think the danger isn't in the immediate, and that's what I have to keep in mind. I think the, I think the concern is down the line of, of the U.S. having stable creditors, and if the China is willing to continue to bankroll us, and if they're not continuing, they're continuing to bankroll us at what price, right? And if they choose to say, we want a quid pro quo relationship, we want to leverage this politically in any ways that they choose to do so. During World War II, the United States had things that it wanted. It wanted make sure that the dollar was the dominant reserve currency. It wanted to make sure that it broke into British trading markets. And so the Chinese could pick from whatever it wants to say, like, we, will, we want to trade on this in some way, shape, or form politically. And it could do the same thing to uh, us. The Suez Canal crisis in 1956 was a case of economic yes. uh, diplomacy where the, the Eisenhower administration basically said, you're going to leave the Suez Canal Zone, UK, right. or we're not going to back your not, loans, and we're not exactly. going to support you in the IMF, and we're not going to support exactly. the Exactly, that's sterling. exactly right. Um, a good man over at Cornell, Jonathan Kirshner, writes about that, mm -hmm. that these are forms of leverage. Now, now they're windows of opportunity, I think, and I, and I think that's how we need to think about them. Um, it's when they come up, right? So the Suez, they didn't manufacture the Suez crisis. It's a window of opportunity to say, okay, we have a leverage here, and we're going to use it. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, so I can remember the, uh, the debate around paying for the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was in Washington. I was working in the Senate at the time. 2003? Uh, 2003. Okay. Yeah. And I, I can remember there being amendments offered by members uh, to pay for yes. uh, the, the war by uh, rolling back some of the tax cuts. Yes. Uh, they failed resoundingly. <laughs> yes. Um, what does this say about our politics? I have, a heavy, I have a heavy heart talking about this concept of sacrifice, but I agree. So the, the, that opens the bigger question of are we always going to, is, is borrowing locked in? Are we always going to pay for wars by borrowing now? What are the opportunities to raise taxes to pay for war? And are we ever going to see it again? And, um, because I think if you're not going to pay your own way for a, a sort of a, a, an existential a, a serious threat, then what, what, will you, right. what will you pay for? Well, so I think there's, 
the research of various people have kind of come to two conclusions that, uh, uh, that I think are viable options here. One is we go back to these big wars that demand sacrifice. Demand sacrifice. And I mean that's, also, a, that's an option? Because I know, that's, it sounds that's, horrible. That's, okay, I should yeah. say that as an option. Yeah. Um, but sacrifice, unfortunately, of, of life, life and limb mm -hmm. of individuals. Um, it is through these big wars that demanded sacrifice that people started to pay their share. Um, so Pew, in, uh, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, does a study looking at sacrifice. And what they found is that a majority of Americans acknowledge that military members and their families are sacrificing for these wars. But they, you know what they also acknowledge? That that's just what you choose for being in the military. These wars don't affect us. That's their choice. Now compare this to 1950, 1950-51. Gallup poll does various surveys on sacrifice. Remember, this war is paid for entirely by taxation with the highest tax, rate, tax rates the United States has ever seen. The Korean War. Yes, because yeah. there are taxes that have yet to be rolled back from World War II. So we're in a very high tax bracket during the Korean War. And Gallup does surveys like, you know, how should we pay for this war? Do you feel you're sacrificing enough? And a majority of Americans are saying we should be taxed more to pay for the war. Can you imagine that? I can't, and, but I also, there, there's, a, there's a fundamental shift, though, in public attitudes towards the role of government. Mm. And when you have um, national leaders who suggest in national campaigns that they only pay the taxes that they absolutely have to pay, right? Um, it seems to me that there's a, that there's a, there's, there's a not-so-subtle message there, that taxes are not a civic duty, right. but taxes are something to be avoided. Right, so, so, that, so option, horrible option, we shouldn't even call it option yeah. one, is, is this big sacrifice. Yeah. Is there another pro, you know, potential way? Um, and one answer may be partisanship. So there's been a couple studies, one by Sarah Krebs at Cornell, another by Kevin Norinzi over at Lehigh Valley University that looks at these big increases in military spending and how they're paid for beyond just um, immediate wars, uh, war finance. And what they found is that left, center left governments um, in the United States, Democrats, mm -hmm. um, are more likely to pay for big increases in military spending by taxation. And I should say, you're like, well, that still doesn't sound politically tenable, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like that's not going to happen. I uh, actually did a survey experiment with some colleagues of mine, Doug Kreiner at Cornell, um, in 2014, uh, a random experiment surveys, and we questioned individuals and found that taxes on the wealthy was not politically unpopular. There was no negative effect on the support for a potential conflict. So there's an opening for the left to take it as a window of opportunity to pull back the narrative and say, we're going to tax to pay for these wars moving forward. So define social inequality in some detail. What are we talking about when you say social and economic sure. inequality? Oh, that's a, it's a great question, which is a little beyond me, but I'll take a stab at it and what I'm looking at. So inequality in thinking about uh, who owns wealth in the United States. So one thing that drew me to this topic when I was studying uh, for an article I did in Foreign Affairs was that 9 million Americans are unbanked. 20, yeah. Unbanked means unbanked. They, they have no bank accounts. Yes. No, no savings. Okay. Or yeah, 24 to 25 million American oh. households. Wow. Um, have households, not individuals, households, 25 million American households have unsecure, um, at, use partially unsecured financial institutions. I know. I was like, you got to be kidding me. But that's when I, to bring it back to this war bond, it's a postal savings plan, right? War bonds provide secure avenues for saving, backed by the government that allow individuals to save. There was a CRS report that looked at one reason for low inequality in the United States is the lack of savings. So promoting savings in the United States is a really big deal. So I don't want to get too far out over my skis. Sure. We've got about uh, two minutes left here. But the is, is there a link between these kinds of debates and, I mean, I, I'm thinking of uh, the difference between democracy and oligarchy. Hmm. Is that, is that a fair comparison? Like, like, I think about World War II as this great democratic war. 12 million men and women uh, in uniform, under arms, uh, the entire society being mobilized for it. This was mm -hmm. a popular war, right? right? Not, I'm not saying popular in that it was... We don't want to be right? doing it, but we, have, we, right. we agree in the cause and, and this collective and sacrifice. everybody was in it. Right. It seems like what you're saying is that we've created this praetorian elite that goes off and fights the wars. 
and we're going to pay for it by taxing people, but the, anybody who's going to benefit from it is this, this wealthy class yes. that has the means. That seems to be a road to oligarchy. Am I, am I overstating it? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. And that's, this is why I, I'm glad to be here, because I think we need to sound the alarm of saying, like, it's not just like, oh, these wars that continue for 17 years and counting. Well, oh, our children are just going to be paying these wars and everyone else. No. We're just, we're, we're concentrating wealth in the United States by doing this. And I, again, I, I come back to this, but it just doesn't have to be that way. The creation of a robust American middle class was partially due to the financing of World War I, World War II, and Korea. I, I never want to say wars are good, but wars are windows of opportunities to have a positive redistribution of wealth in a country. So if the ordinary person is concerned about this, what would you advise that person to do? Pay their taxes. <laughs> that sounds so flippant. Pay their taxes, be aware, um, and, th and, and decide, is this something you want to fund and have a conversation about collective sacrifice? Is this worth sacrificing for? And if so, then we need to be paying our taxes and doing that. Do you uh, have hope that that's, uh, I think in just in about 15 Ooh, seconds, here, the politics of that are, is perilous, right? Um, yeah. I can't imagine a politician saying, pay your taxes. My husband always says, hope is not a plan. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. Yeah. But I do have hope. I think as we think about what a new deal, right? We have this, uh, this, this narrative right now. There's a new deal on the rise and a green new deal. Well, a new deal is a collective sacrifice. And I think maybe we can have that in the future. Rosella Capella Zelensky, thank you so much for being with thank us. You. The book is How States Pay for Wars. You want to check it out. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. He's G. Wayne Miller. He's Nurse and a Cold. I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more storing the public square.